Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Jeff Brown at New Life Church in Hammond, Indiana. That's where we're from. So uh, if you enjoy our sermons, uh, if you've been blessed by our sermons, or you have a prayer request, I know that's something that's not been asked recently, but uh, if you would like to communicate with us, either by Facebook or by other means, uh, we have a phone number that uh, is on. I don't know if it's on the, the thing or not. It should be. Uh, please do so. we like to see if we're reaching out to more than just a few of us. We want to reach out to as many in the whole world as possible. YouTube or any other way. So uh, please uh, do that with us. We appreciate that. If you would turn your Bibles to the Genesis chapter 39. Sorry for that little detour. Because I'm speaking about detours today. Uh, for some reason, I think, Mike Hill, a couple weeks ago or so, you preached about something similar to this. But the Lord brought it to my attention to, to bring it in a different way, I guess. Uh, everybody knows the story of Joseph, I bet, don't they? One of the one, one thing they know about is Jesus. The other one that seems like, I, I, especially the last few years, Joseph has been preached about by us, by like every major preacher you see on TV, by preachers that I don't even know and I get to listen to them <clears throat> at another church or another event or something of that nature. Joseph seems to come up a lot. Why is that so? Well, Joseph is a picture of Jesus. That's kind of the reason why. Everything in the Old Testament is a picture of the coming Lord and Savior and is a picture of the complete order that God has set for us on this earth. Now you say, Brother Jeff, uh, you're preaching on Joseph. That's good. I've heard a lot about Joseph. But uh, kind of tired of Joseph. Maybe you've heard a lot of Joseph. But you get tired of Jesus? I hope not. Because Joseph is a type of Jesus. Abraham was a type of Jesus. Moses was a type of Jesus. Uh, everything you see in the Old Testament is a type of Jesus. So you cannot take the Old Testament away from this book. You have to have the Old Testament to understand the New Testament. You have to have the New Testament to kind of see what happened in the Old Testament that pointed back forward to Jesus. And uh, back forward. Is that an oxymoron statement? Back forward? So, man, I'm just profound today, I guess. But no, let's read some scripture, though. Genesis chapter 39, starting, I want to start at verse 19. So it was, when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Father, Lord, I just pray that you make this sermon prosper for the people that are listening today, dear Father, that they will be able to take something with them to apply to their lives, to share with others, to preach and to teach uh, your word. There's not a copyright on your teaching, Lord. There's not a fee we have to pay to share your word. So let us do it openly and boldly in Jesus' name. Amen. Four proofs of detours in your life. God's detours. What do you say God's detours? Well, there's a difference between God's detours and our detours. Joseph, if you look earlier in chapters before, his brothers hated him. Didn't they? They pretended to kill him. They took the coat of many colors and gave it to his father and said he's dead. Uh, they sold him into slavery. That's a big detour right there. He did, really didn't do nothing wrong. I mean, nothing morally wrong. Maybe he might have had a big head at that time. But he did nothing morally wrong. 
he did nothing scripturally unworthy. But you got 11 brothers against one brother. Actually, probably 10 brothers, because I don't think Benjamin was with him at the time. And they want to get rid of him. They called him all kinds of names. You're a dreamer. You're this. You're that. So Joseph gets sold into slavery. We know how that goes. And he ends up in Potiphar's house. Potiphar was a, uh, a subject under Pharaoh. But he was up there in rank. He was up there uh, probably real close. Maybe a vice president. Maybe the cabinet. If you look at today's American you know, politics system. Something of that nature. Well, Potiphar had a wife that liked nice guys. You know, not just nice guys, you know, like nice guys finished last, but guys that were handsome, that she thought she might have had some potential to be with, things of that nature. Uh, but we're going to get into that. I want to give you four proofs that the detour that you're on, if you have not committed any sins of your own, is God's detours for you. Sometimes God puts us on detours. I've been on a couple myself. Uh, may still be on one, to be honest with you. I don't, I kind of know, but these are four proofs that prove to me that I'm on what God wants me to do, not what I want to do. What God wants to do and not what others want to do. He'll use others but usually it's, they think they're doing it on their own, but they're really not. Detour proof number one, that you are persecuted for righteousness sake. That's in verse 19, he said, So it was when his master heard the words, which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner, that, his, that, fa that Potiphar's anger was aroused. Joseph didn't do anything. Joseph was trying to run away, from Potiphar's wife. Potiphar wasn't there. Nobody else was there. It was just Joseph and Potiphar's wife. She wanted him to lay with him, her. She, he said no. He left. His coat came off. And she used it as a bribe. Or as a blackmail tool. For Joseph. Joseph did nothing wrong. Matter of fact he did everything right. In this situation. And I would do the same thing if somebody would come up to me that way too. Well, Joseph wasn't married, but I am. I believe me, I ain't going to sacrifice my marriage for another woman that might be attracted to me, which I don't have nothing to worry about because there isn't no other woman attracted to me. <laughs> Praise God. And if they are, they don't stand a chance because I've been with my wife a lot longer than I would have ever been with this person or that person. But... Proof number one, persecuted for righteousness' sake. That means you're committed to God, caused him, his commitment to God, caused him to be incarcerated, to be put in jail. He was consistent with his faith. He didn't, wasn't wishy-washy. He said, oh, well, maybe just this one chance. Nobody's here. Nobody's going to know. But he didn't do that. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20 says, suffering for something that is going somewhere is righteous is persecution. How authentic is your faith? Is your faith authentic, authentic enough that you'll get persecuted for righteousness? I have been persecuted for righteousness. I know that other people in this room have been persecuted for righteousness. I know, other fa I know missionaries and I know other preachers that have been persecuted for righteousness and they did nothing wrong, but they are called hypocrites. They are called bigots. They're called racists. They're called this. They're called that. They're called all kinds of things and none of that's true. None of it was true. So, I would much rather suffer for the cause of Christ than for the cause of my own sin. If I fall and I'm persecuted because, you know, I did something with another woman or a man or if I they stole something or I robbed a bank or if I did this or that, if I get persecuted for doing something wrong, what is that to God? You're getting your just desserts. But if you're getting persecuted for Jesus and you're righteous and there's no sin to be found in you, 
that's a good indication that there might be a, a detour God has for you. What are detours meant to do? Does anybody know? If you're on the highway, a detour is meant for you to go around the danger. To go around the danger of road construction. Of course, these days in Hammond, you need to go around the danger of non-road construction. If you're not, especially during the winter, anywhere in Lake County, it's bad. But a detour is meant you to get around something that's being under construction, which in this case is Joseph. Joseph is being under uh, under construction, but he doesn't want him to go here, so he detours him there. And it doesn't look good to us, does it? It looks unfavorable. It looks unfair. God, I've done everything right. Why are you punishing me? Is sometimes the attitude that we have when God does that. I, I, the only reason I say this is because I've been there. Okay? Turns out that God wasn't punishing me at all. He was preparing me. He was actually had me, and He still has me under construction. There's a song called, He's Still Working on Me to Make Me What I Ought to Be. He shaped the sun, the moon, and the stars, and he's still working on me. Till the day I die, until the day you die, if you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, he's always working on you and improving you. I sell vacuums for a living. One of the vacuum companies we sell says their motto is, is always better. They're always improving, huh? They're always improving. They're always making things better. They understand that the product they make is a good product, but they can always make it better. And that's what God is doing with us. He's always making us better. Proof number two, God shows up in our suffering. He doesn't say, okay, you're suffering, bye. I'll wait till your suffering's done and I'll come back. No, he says, I'm with you in the suffering. Verses 21 says this, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. And he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of his prison. Verse 23, And the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because guess what? The Lord was with him. Do you know the Lord is with us in our persecution when it's righteous persecution? I dare to say that the Lord is with us when we mess up ourselves. And we have to suffer because He loves us. But He's going to allow us to suffer. But He's going to be there with us through it. Not on the sidelines over here. Say, oh, yeah. And this is what we do with people all the time. You committed this sin up. Oh, okay, we have nothing to do with you. But God always has something to do with you. He doesn't have something to always do something with your sin if you're sinning. But he always has something to do with you. He loves you. He adores you. He created you. But it shows up, God shows up in your suffering. Who's suffering today? I, get, I guarantee you, everybody in this room, in this house, is suffering something. I guarantee you, everybody that you run into, that you contact with, is suffering something. Is it by their own hand or by the hand of God? Don't look like the hand of God does it when you're suffering, does it? Suffering never <laughs> looks like this is a God thing. But it, at times it can be. And when He's with you in His suffering, in your suffering, the Lord is with Him. Kindness, God is showing kindness to Joseph while He's in jail and suffering. Why? Because it says it showed mercy. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor, gave him favor in the sight of who? Of the keeper of the prison, the head honcho. We would call them the warden. Gave him. He didn't say you had to earn it, did he? God gave Joseph favor in his suffering. When Corey Ten Boom and her family were in prison, and things were looking bad and she was in a place where the fleas and the stuff were at a lot she said 
and the lice. She said, I thank God for the fleas and the lice. Why? Because the prison people would not come near her while she was talking to somebody through the window. Or that would come and give her food. Or things like that. She thanked God for the fleas and the lice. Well, we don't know, do we? No, we got fleas and lice in our house. We throw everything out. We have to. But this is prison. This is suffering. There's the prison of suffering by our own hand or by the hand of God. And sometimes it looks worse than even what we've done in our own hand. Doesn't it? Sometimes it looks worse. You think of the Nazi concentration camps. You think the people in Cambodia and Ethiopia and Iran and Iraq, the persecuted Christians in those countries, and Turkey and China and everything else. They're suffering. But are they suffering for their own sake? For their own sin? No. No. They're not. They're suffering for the cause of Christ. And therefore, God gives them kindness. The one, there's one prisoner in Turkey that they took him out of prison. He's now under house arrest and hopefully going to be heading home. We don't know for sure. So we need to pray for him. <coughs> he showed kindness in jail and favor without changing your situation. Well, God, I don't want kindness or favor. I want to get out of this thing. I want to get out of jail. I want my $200 and I want to go past jail. Like Manapha. Guess what? Sometimes we're not supposed to go, you know, that God will stop the situation. Sometimes He does. I've seen Him stop the situations before. There's other times that He has not. There's other times that He's delayed. I think of Jeremiah in the Bible. Several times they threatened to kill Him. But God saved Him. They eventually did. But not until God said so. Not until God said it was time. Jeremiah fulfilled his purpose. The weeping prophet. Talking about somebody who suffered. He suffered a lot. During the time that he was a prophet. Why did he suffer? Because he spread God's word. About judgment. Upon Israel. Upon Judah. He also spread... So God's word about judgment about all the other countries that were going to persecute Israel and Judah and put them in captivity. Jeremiah didn't have a very fine didn't have a very fun job. It wasn't fun at all. It wasn't comfortable at all. It wasn't rewarded at all. It was thankless job. You remember that when you talk about your preachers at church. Remember that when you talk about leaders, spiritual leaders that you uh, like to talk back about, backbite, gossip, put that knife in the back or you're giving them a kiss on the cheek. Remember that if you are that kind of person. Kindness and favor without changing your situation and that he hasn't forgotten you in your situation. God has not forgotten us in our situations. Right now, as far as America goes and where we live, we live in a conservative state and things, and things are a little bit better for us, but when you start getting out to the East Coast and the West Coast, things are getting worse. And it starts from them and moves in. It's going to happen, brothers and sisters, or non-brothers and sisters. My job today is to teach you that you need to get saved, with or without detours. He hasn't forgotten us while we're in a situation, and He is with you. Let Him do it. Let Him do it. You know, this is a confirmation of a second confirmation. When I really think about things that God, that God may or may not want me to do, I want confirmation, kind of like Gideon did. In the book of Judges, he got confirmation. And when you're suffering in your situation for no reason, and you know that God is there because he's there, let him do it. Let him do it twice. How do you, how do you get a second confirmation? We're going to find out here very shortly. Let him do it twice. Look for that again moment. Listen for that voice. Potiphar, now this is what I want to tell you. 
I don't think Potiphar was mad at Joseph. Because he knew Joseph. He knew Joseph was a man of upstanding quality and situation. But I think he also knew his wife. And she could have been a hussy. Obviously, she was here. Right? I believe Potiphar probably knew that. And to please her, he put him in jail. But if you look at it, he said he put him in a king's prison. It's the difference between a king's prison and a regular prison. A king's prison is kind of like what we would call a white collar jail. Okay. These were well known people of the king, the king's servants, the king's people, you know, those that served with him. I believe Potiphar put him in there and he, he told the keeper of the prison. Now this guy, he'll, he'll take care of anything you need. He's a great leader. I just have to put him here for a while. Maybe that's what he said. That's conjecture. Don't get me wrong. It may or may not have been that. But he didn't put him in, you know, in, in a place where he tied him chain, chain. He wasn't chained hand and foot. He wasn't being starved to death. He wasn't just drinking bread and water. But Joseph was in charge of all the prisoners. Almost right away. It doesn't say that he was in on those things. I believe Potiphar knew his wife. I believe Potiphar knew who Joseph was. I believe that Potiphar knew how what Joseph's stand was. Or he wouldn't have put him in that position to start with in his own house. He would have never trusted Joseph if he had... If Joseph had surrendered to temptation to this woman, don't think it would have ever happened. And I don't think it would have ever happened while he was in prison. Some say it was a white collar prison. Maybe it was. I don't know. But he was put in charge, and the prisoners' keeper, the prison keeper, said, "I ain't got no worry with him. Go ahead, do everything you, everything, anything you want while you're in prison." Did you know that Joseph had a mission, uh, a, a ministry within the prison? Chuck Colson started prison prison fellowship in the seventies. But there was a prison fellowship in Exodus and Genesis. There was a prison fellowship in Genesis, and it started with Joseph. That Joseph is a leader. Potiphar knows his wife. This is this ain't Joseph. Potiphar promotes him. He gets a promotion. Boom. Third proof that you are on a part of God's detour plan when He gives you people to minister to in your situation and who had the same situation as you. Well, there were two people that came to prison. One was the cupbearer. One was the baker. They both had dreams. And up to this point, since he talked to his brothers until now, he hasn't been able to use his dreaming interpretation skills. He gets to use these skills once again to tell the cupbearer, in three days you're going to be released and you're going to go back to your position. I'm trying to keep it short. In three days, baker, your head's going to get cut off in three days. Now, you may say that might have been, well, that's a bad dream to have, and that's a bad interpretation. Joseph sure wasn't doing very good, you know, one out of two. I'll tell you, though, it's two out of two. Because that gave the baker three days to prepare for eternity. That gave the baker the chance to believe in the God of Joseph. So was it or was it not? Now, the cupbearer went back. Two years, two years before he finally realizes, hey, this the the Pharaoh's having a dream. Oh, guess what? I know somebody who's had a dream, and 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 is a great interpreter. I had a dream, and let me tell you what he told me, and it was true. He also told about the baker, and the baker, and that was true too. So when he gives you people to minister to, to you who is in the same situation, a ministry in your situation. There will be a temptation to worry only of yourself. 
When you're in a bad situation, what do we usually worry about? Ourselves. We worry about, maybe we worry about our family. We worry about how we're going to have, Mike here had a job loss for over almost a year. I'm sure he had a temptation to think about yourself and only nobody else. <laughs> but God brought him through it. God gave him a detour. And I'm sure there'll be, if I, if I live much longer, God will give me more detours. Because he's not finished with me yet. He's not finished with you yet. He's not finished with any of us yet. Better take time to minister to others while you are in the mess that you are in. Why? I had one preacher tell me personally in my face at, at, at preaching time, when you concentrate on others' problems and considerations and issues and things, yours doesn't seem very big, does it? I want to help these people. Yeah, I'm in the same mess you are, but I'm willing to help you. Don't know how many stories I've heard of Michigan in action and prisoners of war taking care of their other prisoners of war fellows. And they themselves did not get delivered, but the person they helped did. And they never came home. But while you're in this mess, while you're on this detour, God doesn't expect you to worry about everything else about your detour, but there's other people on that detour too. That's right. There's other people on that detour. Some by hook and by crook on their own power and some not. Just like Joseph. Mike here didn't do nothing bad. The, the store closed. The store closed. What are you going to do about that? He's on a detour for a while. I've been fortunate. I've been on detours of unemployment myself over the course of 35 years of being here. But that, but that was only for about a year and a half total, praise God, so far in my life. Out of 35 years of working and living up here, I've only had about a year and a half of unemployment. God's taken care of me. God's going to take care of you. When my wife had a stroke, God took care of us. We thought we were going to live high on the hog and we were on our way there. Esther had a stroke. So much for being high on the hog. God doesn't want us to be. He wants us to stay low. Low and humble. He wants us to be successful in His eyes and not ours. Very important to remember that to suffer Paul said it before. It's an honor to suffer for the Lord. I don't see it that way typically, like I ought to. I do more so now than I used to. But I sure didn't in my 20s, even though I was called to preach when I was 16. Even though that uh, I've been married to my wife for almost 27 years, we didn't see the detour coming of her having a stroke. But God knew what needed to be done. God took care of us. When I lost, when I stopped being a pastor for a while, God gave me a detour, a detour that I wanted. Actually, I did want this one, but I didn't want it as long as I had it. But God had other had other things in mind. Last and final fourth proof was when it looks like He will deliver you. And you're on the edge of the crevice of the threshold of the door, and the door slams in your face. And you don't get delivered. There are some times that I have not been delivered from my detour or my situation, and I've had to go through it all the way. A good illustration of this is when my wife cooks, and she puts a piece of meat in the stove, and you put it in there, and it smells, good, it smells cooked, it looks cooked on the outside, but then you stick a fork in it. When you stick a fork in it, and you see something you're not supposed to see, maybe more blood in the meat or whatever, or you know there's something that's not right, and boy, you, that piece of meat comes out of the stove, it's ready to come out, and say, yay, I'm not in the heat no more. 
slides that rack back in with the meat on there and closes the door again. It's not done yet. That means sometimes God's not done with you yet, even in your detour and your supposed, ah, oh, I'm ready moment. Guess what? You're not ready. That's another proof that you're on God's detour sometimes. Isaiah 40, verses 14 and 15, and verse 23, all, uh, well, not Isaiah, I'm sorry, in chapter 39, verses, or chapter 40, verses 14, 15, and 23, did not remember, the baker, did not, not the baker, but the cupbearer did not remember Joseph for two years. Always remember, and I'm preaching this to myself, brothers and sisters, I'm preaching this to you, the lost person, God has got you on his mind. God has the best for you on his mind. Sometimes to get past the deep sometimes to get past the problems of life, sometimes to get past their danger, you have to have a detour. What if my wife didn't have a stroke and and we were high on the hog and living well. Guess what? I, I hate to say it, but I probably won't rely on God as much. Well, look what we did to, for ourselves. We might on Thanksgiving say, thank you, Lord, for giving me the ability to be smart and you know, all that kind of stuff and to be this and stuff. I did it on my own, but I thank you for at least those parts. No, God, that, that's not where God wants us at. God wants us to say, hey, I did nothing on my own. God says, I'm the one that will do it for you. Not in your time, not in your way, not in your style, not in, your, not in the way that you have planned. We're praying for a situation now for our church. It's got to be God's way. It can't be Pastor Larry's way. It can't be Jeff Brown's way. It can't be our church's way. It can't be anybody else's way that we have to deal with on this situation has to be God's way. Yeah, I get hurried and I get impatient. I want it done. I want it done now. Same here. But guess what? I have to realize that this is a detour. I have to realize that while I'm on detour, there's construction going on in that situation. While I'm going the detour, sometimes around here in Hammond, you might have to go four or five miles around railroad tracks, and that's a that's a detour by itself without even a sign. As soon as you see a train, I did it yesterday. I got off, we went, we were coming home, and I saw the train. I thought, oh man, I want to beat this train. And then you go down here to Orchard Drive and Parish and and 169th and and then you keep going and you, you know you just every intersection every stop I thought I could get by was another detour because of that train yeah maybe I wasn't supposed to go down there not just because of the train maybe there was something going on in either side of the train that I wasn't supposed to be a part of I sure don't like those kind of detours but and you, you know you may want to talk under your breath and say dirty brick and brack and rick and whatever God says, i got this detour for you. I need you to take it. I need you to be compliant with, with it. Amen. God, please, let us be compliant. Lord, work on my attitude. Sometimes the detour is to teach patience that we know we're supposed to ask for, but we don't really want. Who wants patience? Nobody wants patience. I want my popcorn in five minutes or less. I want my pizza delivered in less than a half hour like Domino's. I want Jimmy John's crazy fast delivery. God doesn't deliver that fast usually. Sometimes he does. I'm not saying he doesn't. But most of the time he's teaching us something. And while he's teaching us something, he's building something better for us. Heaven is going to be such a wonderful place. The longer I live, that's my detour for heaven. 
maybe there's a reason that I'm still I'm 54 instead of 34 and died. My wife and I got married in 1991, November 4th. November 5th, we went to the church we got married at because we didn't have a honeymoon. We just went to a hotel and came back down the road with railroad tracks. I had a deer on my, on my wife's side look us straight in the face on the windshield with red eyes. We almost hit that thing. We went down a little further and we took our breaths and, you know, you keep going down a little further. At that time, we lived in Griffith. There's railroad tracks. Griffith is another place for bad railroad tracks. And a train came just right behind us once we crossed over. There were no lights. There were no horns. There were no stops of any kind. We almost had our rear end rear-ended. We were almost gone then. That same night, I've learned to take detours with a little happiness, you know over the course of the years that my wife and I have been married and that I've been in the ministry and raising kids and working on grandkids and, and all that kind of stuff. So when you see God sticking a fork in you, it's almost done but not quite. God's putting, at that point, God's putting the finishing touches on you and me. He's putting finishing touches on the situation. So that when Joseph came out of that situation, guess what happened to him? He was second in command to Pharaoh. He could do anything, go anywhere, have anything, have anywhere. But Joseph had to be prepared. I got called to preach at 16. I didn't I didn't really didn't get to preach a whole lot except on a, on a, a church bus for years. Until I got my first church and when I was 30, so 14 years. I had to be patient. Was I patient? Sometimes yes, a lot of times no. I'm more patient now than I used to be. My son even tells me that, which is a surprise. So, But it's more important what God tells me. So it's more important what God does for you during those detours and through you and in you and with you. Father God, I just thank you so much. Help us, Lord, to think of these detours, dear Father, as uh, under construction, finishing up to your perfection, not to ours. May souls be saved and lives changed, Lord, and maybe because they have not received Christ, they are on this long-standing detour until they ask you into their heart and their lives. Help them to realize that we're all sinners, there's none righteous, no, not one that we must confess our sins unto Jesus, make Him Savior and Lord of our lives, believe that God hath raised Him up from the dead, and that we would be saved. Lord, we give You praise and glory for the souls that will be saved. In Jesus' name, 